It has been an age since we talked to uh, Jacinda Ardern last. The wheels turn slowly in this country, it appears, but we have a government, a cabinet and a programme to get on with, and she is with us. Very good morning to you. <laughs> good, good morning, Mike. And we've done all of that before we've even got the official count in. Indeed, and congratulations. <laughs> is, is that what, look, I mean, I'm, I'm not, don't want to start on a criticism, but things, you've been around for two, two and a half weeks now. Why don't we move faster? Well, we're actually relative to every formation of government. We we have been. You know, no one's uh, set out arrangements in less than a 12 to 14 day period. You know, it does take a, a bit of time to work through, you know, even the nature of a cooperation agreement. But even then, we will still, it hasn't changed. None of that actually changed my timeline for the swearing in. Um, we'll be swearing in uh, the government before we even have the special votes um, all counted, which is a, stamp, a substantial number this time, yeah. uh, because we still feel that we've got the mandate to, to do that. Uh, and so actually things are moving at, at relative pace compared to what you'd usually see. Are we too slow in general then in that case, the fact we don't have the specials? Do you know the GDP figure for the third quarter doesn't come out in this country until the 17th of December? Half the world's already got theirs. How come we're so slow? Hey. Yeah, look, when it comes to the special, I'll come to the special votes first. Um, actually, the Electoral Commission uh, did ask for a bit of, usually it's a couple of weeks. So their view was that the number of specials this year would be higher and it would require three. And uh, there have been a higher number. You know, I think in the aftermath of the election, we will sit down with them and just see whether or not that's still necessary. We always want to crack on as quickly as we can. But some of the changes that were made, um, for instance, to allow people to enrol and vote on the same day did increase the number of specials and that was brand new so so let's let's give that some time and see what's needed on GDP and just in terms of actually just some of our stats generally you know we do have sometimes lags that from time to time we we question whether or not um, we are moving as quickly on some of our data as we could of course the government statistician is independent so we can ask the questions but they still need to make sure that they're doing a robust job in your observation as you will have been looking around the country side in the last couple of weeks, do you think mm. we're in trouble with an asset-led support program that's getting a bit distorted? In other words, um, the, the, the bank is trying their best to pump money into the economy, but it's all either going into savings accounts, under mattresses, into art or into houses. Well, I, I do not, I personally don't believe, um, and in fact, you know, I'd say, you know, all of our senior ministers don't believe that a singularly an asset-led recovery would be the right thing for New Zealand. You'll see that our COVID recovery plan actually, you know, is focused across the board. We've gone everything from supporting small businesses um, with digital technology use through our voucher scheme, you know, things like flexi wage to support businesses to take people on even in this environment, uh, and alongside that, you know, an, an infrastructure program as well. So I would agree we need to really try and make sure it's a diverse response. The one thing on the people putting money under the mattress, Mike, you know, what I say, there is, you know, everyone would agree, every economist would agree that if you are going to be uh, focused on stimulus, you focus on the people who are on those lower incomes. They are the ones who spend it and they are the ones who therefore stimulate the economy. You worried about housing? Oh, I, I, I'm never not worried about housing, to be honest. You know, it is fair to say that uh, I was just reading some of the comments out of ANZ, you know, uh, and certainly where their lending has been for, you know, this last period of time. Uh, no one predicted that they would see a record month for home loans, for instance, in October. Uh, it's it's just outperforming what anyone expected in this COVID environment. I'd say a lot of that will be probably New Zealanders coming home. You know, I'm, everyone will know anecdotally stories of Kiwis coming home, some who have been away for, the, for decades. You can't blame them, but it will be having an impact. Do you want to have any desire to increase the amount of quarantine facility we have? And I ask that re-Christmas now that Air New Zealand have been told they can't sell tickets. And or B, we had 2,600 places empty last week. So do you want to expand it? And B, why do we have so many places empty when they're empty? And, and look, we, that is not the case going forward into Christmas. You know, I was just looking at some of our data. So from the 3rd of November, we now have the booking system in place. So everyone that flies has to have um, uh, basically a voucher where they've pre-booked um, their quarantine space. 
So for, I believe it's the 23rd to about the 12th, we basically are at capacity. Kiwis are coming home for Christmas. Some of them are coming home permanently in that period. Uh, we've also very spike in arrivals um, right through from now to the 12th of November. So we're really hitting our capacity. We do keep a bit of a buffer. That's for people needing to return on emergency. It's to allow us, if we have an incident at a facility where we need to relocate people, that we'll be able to do that. So just that emergency capacity, but otherwise we've been running pretty tight, Mike. But don't we want more? Because there are people who want, and it's not about the people wanting to come to the country, it's about the people here who want to bring labour and skills into the country and they can't because the place is full. Uh, of course, you know, within that allocation, and of course people have seen the stories about some of the workers coming in, within that allocation we are using the booking system to bring in essential workers as well. The booking system will enable us to do more of that because we'll have a better sense of the forward look for our capacity. But your question on do we want more, you know, at the moment, uh, you know, right through the last six months, we've had 65,000 people through our managed isolation facilities. Yes, we want to be able to bring in more essential workers. The one thing I'm mindful of is that as we look to grow capacity, we have to make sure we're doing it safely. You know, we've got a case overnight of an MIQ worker. We've built the system to be able to deal with that. That is going to happen from time to time. But we have to make sure that we have a really rigorous regime that when that happens, we're managing it properly. And whenever you grow, you grow the risk. What chance an Australian bubble by Christmas do you think? Oh, look, I think the Pacific is moving along pretty pretty well, and that one's very straightforward for us. So the, the work we're doing with the Cook Islands and Niue is good. On Australia, a little complication there, Mike, is I, when I last spoke to Scott Morrison, you know, we'd been trucking along with the bubble work. Then Australia changed up its approach. We said to them, look, we need to just get a bit more detail on how you're working your interstate borders. Because actually some states absolutely would be ready to go. But what we need clarity on is what is the protocol between that state and, say, someone who does have community transmission? Once we work through how some of that is working, we'll be in a bit more of a secure place. So your argument is the ball's in their court at the moment? Uh, we, we do need a bit, a bit more from them at the moment. We've asked for that, and I'm confident that we'll be able to work through it. But I'm a bit hesitant to give you timelines until we do. Is Winston Peters going to get a diplomatic job? Uh, that's not something he's spoken to me about. It's not something he's asked for. You know, I think he's still even contemplating what's next for him. Uh, and so look, I've seen the speculation, but I'd say it's purely that. Um, there's no, no question in my mind, though, that um, you know, Winston Peters has made an enormous contribution to New Zealand. That's my strong view. How is it David Clark can go cycling, quit, and then still get a job in Cabinet? I actually, at the time, you know, remember, Mike, the proximity between when I moved him out of health uh, to when it was clear that we were going to have, you know, obviously the scheduled election. It, for, for me, it did not warrant a reshuffle at that point. I was very open and about the fact that I, you know, saw that David had uh, merit and potential roles for him in the future, but at that time it just wasn't the right time to do that. Um, yes, he has made mistakes. He is fully uh, aware of that, takes onus of that, ownership of that, but he also has something, some value to add, and I wouldn't have put him there if I didn't believe that.